All right, Tina, welcome back. I want to say this is for real episode number 10. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think so. Congratulations. Double digits. We've made it. Yes. <laughs> I don't think anyone's counting. If we've got it right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. So this one, I came up with this question today. I think it was on our list, but I just realized like I know a ton about your life, but mostly from like the age 18 and up, right? I know a lot about when you came to the U.S., and what your life looked like there. But I realized I don't actually know a lot about your childhood, like much about the house you grew up in, or even like, I know you live near London. I don't know how close. So the question from our list was, um, what are some of the highlights of your childhood? And I'm super excited uh, to hear you answer Ooh. this one. Oh, I like that question. Um, okay, some of the highlights of my childhood. I'm just going to say some random memories that are coming to mind. Yeah, I'm not please, sure they're highlights yeah. of my childhood, but they're memories that I think are stories and they're quite funny. Okay. So th the first thing that came to mind was, um, uh, the fact that I, as you know, um, spent three years in Indiana from age two to five mm -hmm. and just having, um, a, a neighbor close by, or we were close to all of our neighbors, but one in particular who I still am friends with now, um, who was this lady and I would just go spend all this time with her. And I remember she had a little convertible car. She still has it, this white, um, electric, um, little convertible. Wow. And I remember driving through the Hills. That's actually my first memory, um, was driving through the Hills in this little convertible. Um, so I love that. Wow. That was, I think I highlight. that must've been one of like yeah. the first electric cars. Like that's crazy. Yeah. Like I don't actually understand how it works, but I know she plugs it in and I, I want to say it can only get like an hour or two <laughs> of driving. Um, but, um, but yeah, so that, and then another memory that's coming to mind that you will like, this is not necessarily a highlight, but it came to mind for some reason, probably because it reminds me of the something you would do. But I remember being with my friend Miles who lived in the street next to me and getting um, berries from the top of the road and smearing them all over ourselves <laughs> and then knocking on my parents' door and being like, we're bleeding, we're bleeding. And they were like, great, go away. And we were like, no, we're really bleeding. Um, <laughs> and I don't even know anything about him. Like I have no idea what his last name is. I don't know. I don't know where he lives or anything, like literally nothing. Oh my god! So gosh. that was just one random memory. Um, what else? I remember um, going to my grandma's house a lot uh, and she lived like four hours away by the beach with my sister and with my best friend at the time uh, many times and just having such a fun time um, just being with my grandma and she was so fiercely independent. A lot of what I, who I am comes from her. Mm. Um, and uh, and I bet she, even my now, sister like, and I would like... I was thinking like you could probably oh, yeah. even like remember the smell of her house. I'm sure you can close your eyes and like just those kind of details, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I still, I still have one of her um, little cardigans in a really tightly sealed bag. So every now and again, I like go in and oh. put my nose to it so I can smell her. That's so, yes. amazing. Um, so, you know, but I remember my how, sister and I would always insist. I'm oh, so, I keep cutting you off because I'm delay. so curious, but like you said the beach, like, <laughs> what does that mean? Is that still in England? Like, did she go like up north? Like, or where, like, where, where, where did she live? Like off the coast? We, yeah, she lived in, in Devon, which is in the, like, if London, if you think about, well, most people can imagine the UK. Mm -hmm. So London is like in the middle of the main section. Mm -hmm. uh, like the main England part. And then Devon is off to the, I guess it would be west and down. There's a little like, there's a little tail end bit. Mm -hmm. um, Devon is on there, the beginning of that part. And then the end part is Cornwall, which people have probably already also heard of. Yeah, yeah. She lived in Devon. So that's about a four hour drive from where my parents were. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was a beach. It was a sandy beach, but it was a red beach. Like the dirt was red. Oh so you'd see God. the sheep that were red because they'd rolled around in the dirt. Yeah. It was like clay-ish. That's incredible. Um, wow. Yeah. And then so so that, that was lived, kind of interesting. You said you lived, but you didn't live exactly like in the heart of the city, did you? Like, did you live in like a smaller suburb of London? Like how big was like the town that you were in? I mean, it's, it would be considered a suburb. I don't think you would call it small anymore. I always say now that it reminds me of a sausage that's expanded too much oh, and yeah. is like bursting at the seams. It's way too many people live there for yeah. the size of the town. Um, but it's, um, 
I mean, I would guess probably by now it's over half a million, if not over a million. I don't know. Oh, I have no wow, idea. Wow. But like, it's a massive place now. But yes, it is 28 miles, I think, from the center of London as the bird flies, yeah. um, a 20-minute train ride. Um, so it's very close. A lot of people who work in London live there. It's kind of the place where you can be close to the countryside. Yeah. And that's the beautiful thing about my parents' house is within five... Uh, <laughs> the train station is a two mile is two miles from my parents' house, and the countryside, as in endless fields mm -hmm. of green, mm -hmm. uh, is also probably about a mile to a mile and a half away. So you've got like both ends of the and the town centre is two miles away. So you've got like everything yeah. there. So yeah. it's a very popular place to live. Um, it's so funny. I, me and my sisters, we said if we outlive our husbands, uh, we're going to open just a little tea house in the English countryside. <laughs> that so would be you, yes. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, I think we had really, well, obviously, like you being, you know, in Europe, like a different childhood. I always forget that bit about you living in Indiana. That's so random. Um, uh -huh. But I love that memory in the convertible. It, it's just so funny how, like, things will stick out in your mind. Um like, why? Why do we? And I think about that when I look at my little two year old daughter. I'm like, is she going to remember any of this? Has she made that first memory yet? You know, it's just, it's just, crazy. yeah. Yeah. And it's always something random. Yeah. It's not like the trips to Disney World no. my parents took. No, it never is. Yeah, it really never is. <laughs> One of my first yeah. memories is like seeing, so I was not in school yet, but my sister was. So she must have been like five or six, and I was probably four. And I just remember like being deeply grieved watching the school bus like gobble her up and drive away and my Aww. mom was like it's okay like you'll get to go next year but like next year might as well have been like 50 years you know um yeah it's yeah. crazy um so tell me some more of yours yeah yeah so it's just crazy like i think it, it's kind of like a goldfish like never knowing the water it swims in right because it's just always in it like growing up where i did so like Hawkinson is a, just a teeny, teeny, tiny little town, not even on the map, didn't even have like a stoplight or a post office or a mayor or any of that, no police. Um, just this little tiny town of like maybe 1,500, 2,000 people um, tucked in the corner of Southwest Washington amid like just kind of rolling farmland and just deep green, like Pacific Northwest forest. So growing up, it's like I did not appreciate the beauty of where I lived. Cause I lived right next to like the gorge and like an hour drive from the Oregon coast. And, and the, behind our house was just 80 acres. We didn't own it. Um, but we just ran around in it all the time, 80 acres of like pristine uh -huh. Washington forest. And I think about like from a very young age, like again, some of my like first memories are like my mom walking us through the woods, like, okay, you can eat this plant. This is a thimbleberry. This is a huckleberry. Um, you can't eat this. This will kill you. This is what plants look like on the inside. And then being like, okay, here's how you follow the creek and find your way home. And here's how far you can go and no farther. Like, and then she had just the the grace to let us go. So it's like my fondest memories as a childhood were those, those summer days that seemed to stretch out forever where you, we would wake up like wolf down breakfast. And then just, we'd be outside from sun up to sundown, just eating like wild strawberries and blackberries and apples and cherries and not even coming back to the house. And my favorite, favorite place in that woods, in that 80 acres of woods, there was like this old, super overgrown gravel lane. And off to the side of it, if you're willing to venture into like the darkness of the woods, there was this old wooden house. Like it had been there probably since before Hawkinson was even a town, like an old, almost like picture like a homesteading cabin. And when I was real little, it was still standing. It was still like upright, but maybe I was 10 or 11 when a big storm came through and, and flattened it to just like a rotting pile of boards. But if you went out there, they had had this old apple orchard in front of that house, which now it was like a dozen trees planted kind of in that grid, so overgrown that like the, the branches just tangled together and like choked out the sunlight, but it still grew apples. And as kids, we would like wander around in there and we would find these old like relics, like ancient rusted tin cans and old barrels and glass jugs. And it was like just the most adventurous like it fostered mm. my imagine, imagination so much. And I think about now if someone's like, oh, go to your happy place. Like my mental happy place is in, yeah. in those woods, like in running around in that old like apple orchard. And I just, I would not, like I've told my husband, like, cause this is, we're happy in the house we're in and everything. But 
I told him, I was like, when we, if we ever move to another house or this or that, the one thing that is vital to me is like, I need my kids to be able to walk out their back door. For me, it was just hopping a barbed wire fence and you go, you just go into the wilderness. Like I just deeply uh, appreciate that now as an adult. And I want that for my kids, you know? Oh, that's amazing. What a beautiful story. And I, you know, it's so interesting. You mentioned that bit at the end there because I have been really struggling with wrestling with Chloe. My youngest is almost three, but she will like open the front door and go out and go to my neighbor's house. If they're not there, she will go inside their house and walk around and look for them. Like she has no fear. She just goes for life. And I love that about her. But at the end of the day, she's two and Amazon trucks aren't thinking about two year olds. So like, How do you wrestle with that? Like you just said, you would want access to something. And I love that in the back of the house, I can like leave her out there and she can do whatever. But like the front, like that part, I love that exploration part of her, but it also scares me to death because it takes one truck to knock her down when she's not like we every time like stop, look at the road or like, you know, try and what do you need to do when you get to the road? Like remind her, but yeah. How do you I mean, I that? think you have to, it's a, it's a, it's a give and take because you, on the one hand, you need to instill in them, okay, these are the things in the world that can hurt you. These are the things that are dangerous, but you also need to allow them to reach that ripe age of early adulthood, having walked without someone holding their hand. So it's, it, it's about, you know, as Charlotte gets older um, and as, you know, my son Emmy is, he just turned one. So it's like, as they very slowly start to understand responsibility. I also have to, as a parent, um, be willing to challenge myself by turning my back for a few extra seconds when she's in the backyard to go inside and say, okay, I'm not going to look out for her every 20 seconds. I'm going to, I'm going to allow her. It's, it's that, it's that push and pull. And, and I think, you know, obviously there's nothing, there's only so much you can do of like, you can't, protect them from everything. She's going to get poison ivy all over her legs. Like you have, like that's going to happen. And, and of course we do all we can to keep any mistakes that are deadly from happening. But I also don't want her to go through childhood without getting a few scars. Mm. I think that's important. Mm-hmm. I think that's valuable. Um, so I'm just yeah. trying to challenge myself with knowing like, okay, it's also important to, to let them go a little bit, you know? Yes, that's so important. And it's funny because Bailey got a few splinters. She got, unfortunately, she got like three within the space of Mm. two days during one stretch. And now she's like every bit of wood. wood. She's like, is this a splinter? Is this this giving me a splinter? She's like obsessed with it. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so she, and now she's like working her way back to going out there. But yesterday I stepped on a bee (laughs) and it, and my toe is like in between my toes. I'm looking at it right now. Like it's swollen up between the bottom of my foot, but it's also swollen my two toes plus the top. Mm. And I was careful. Like I was like, okay, this is a good moment for the kids because I can tell them I got stung by a bee and it's okay yeah. like that's part of life it's it wasn't this big thing although i did call steve being like ah! <laughs> like, like this hurts like, but i thankfully they didn't see that yeah. and um but it's it, it is hard because yeah you you can't like the splinters i was like splinters are a part of life a bee sting a bee sting is a part of life yeah. well, it's um, that, it and goes, it doesn't mean i hate bees right right no. it goes they're back just, to that they're just part of life yeah that that quote of like okay a ship is safe in the harbor, but a ship wasn't made for the harbor, you know? Mm. Um, so we got to let our kids, you know, start to leave the harbor. <laughs> At first, yeah, I'm not going to let them go try to sail to Antarctica, you know? Um, but just <laughs> slowly, you know, one day at a time, like going a little bit farther. I think that's what it's all about. It's just that gentle progress, you know? Um, okay. Last thing I want to share before we cut this one off, because mm-hmm. this has been a long one. I, there, I was watching this program and it talked about different cultures of the world and how they raise kids. And there's, I think it was Japan where they they have this rite of passage. It was somewhere in, in Asia where they, kit, they send like a three-year-old out to the grocery store, um, across, have to cross busy streets, has to cross town. Really? They live in a city to go buy one thing or a few things in the store and then come back. And it's something that they they do, and um, like every child oh. has to pass through this. 
But can you imagine, like, you see this little kid standing at the traffic light, oh, waiting God. for the light to change, and the cars are just going by. It was like, oh, this is so stressful. Oh, but well, I think you and know, this is like, and I promise this will be my last thing before we go. But like, but I see to me that that is like too far. Of like, if the parents just stays at home and like, hey, have fun. Um, my favorite story of like a rite of passage is like the Cherokee, who it talked about. Like, the legend is like when a Cherokee. Um, boy turns 16 that his what he does is he is blindfolded and then he's put sitting on a forest stump all through the night for one night in the forest and he has to sit there with his blindfold on not making a noise until he sees like the ray of sun um, through this blindfold but the the way the legend always ends is like he takes off the blindfold to find that his dad has been sitting on the next stump over all night just in case you know so i think that that to me is like a good of like okay there's the give and take of like let them go through the fear let them go through the panic of like what are these noises am i going to be eaten by a wolf but be there you know in the background if, if needed mm. so all right we'll wrap this one up tina but um that was wonderful and i would say probably 90 percent more deep than, than most of these yes. but but i loved it yes thank you so much sarah